born in Maine and from a French Canadian family. And in Maine, being French Canadian was not a good thing. It was, it's not recognized around here. Every, you're French Canadian, that's what you are. But the French Canadians would look down upon, and we were the ignorant and the uneducated and the baby breeders and the poor people, and regardless of whether you were poor or not. Um, so, you know, I lived in a town that was predominantly French speaking, French Canadian origin, but the governance of the town was all English. So that was the atmosphere in which I grew up, which seems strange around here to, to think of that being, you know, an issue, but it, it's a big issue in Maine. And a few years ago, a French Canadian man was elected governor who turned out to be the precursor of Trump. And so, mm -hmm. and it made me very sad to see the first French Canadian governor be such an idiot and mm -hmm. so awful. But anyway, uh, the town I grew up in was a little tiny, tiny place, fewer than a thousand people, surrounded by a 50 mile radius of forest. So you want to talk about isolation. And the only thing that got me out of it was that we had these nuns in town that had, uh, they were French, uh, French from France <laughs> order. And so they <coughs> spoke French and we of course spoke French. But the <coughs> other thing is that they mainly came, they had a different perspective on the world than we and Jackman did because they had missions in India and I don't know, Egypt and someplace else. And so we learned about the other world from the time that we were little. That and buying pagan babies. I described you know, that. We know. Described we know. It, so you know about <laughs> pagan babies. So between between the nuns and our pagan babies, from a very early age, I had a vision of a world that was larger than Jackman, Maine. And I went away to boarding school for my high school years, and there were girls from Mexico that would come up to learn English, and I became friends with some of them. And in the summer of my junior year. I went down to Mexico for the first time with my friends. And for the life of me, I don't know how it, this happened, but I, I saw a poverty that I did not know existed. It, and, and I saw it, really saw it. And I not only saw the poverty, but the contrast between the way I was living with my friends, where my dirty clothes got picked up in the morning, my bath water was drawn and so forth. We talked about this, Mary. Mm -hmm. and upper-class Mexican family. Yeah, and so I, I, I saw the, the dissonance, and it, it, it didn't, I didn't articulate that at all at the time. It took me many, many years to realize what had happened to me. But then when it came time to graduate from high school, I was thinking, you know, this was in 1959, before the Peace Corps, before women had other opportunities besides being a nurse, a teacher, a mother, an old maid, or a nun. And to me, the nun made the most sense. And so I entered the convent, and I was there for 15 years, no, 12 years, excuse me. And I was never, I never was at home in the convent. So I always say I was in the convent, but I was never a nun. <laughs> it's true. It's a great distinction. It is a great distinction. I mean, I have friends like Maureen. Maureen Fiedler. Of Maureen Fiedler of the Loretto's. And, and others. Interfaith radio. And who, who are really nuns at heart. And that, that wasn't me. So, and, but the other hand of it, I grew up in those years in the convent, 12 years there. And at 27, I became principal of the school that I was teaching at. And that lasted for three years. And then I got a little bit bored and I resigned. But in the meantime, you've heard about Vatican II and all the changes that were taking place. So the community was going through its radical changes, and we had as a consultant to help us along this Jesuit priest called Bill Callahan. And so Bill and I started working together on making plans for the community and you know, making the transition and everything, and that worked out really well. Then we started working together. First of all, we fell in love, and nothing came of that for quite a long time. <laughs> But we decided at one point that, um, well, I came to Washington. And there were a lot of justice and peace centers throughout the United States, religious orders of women and men, the dioceses, parishes. They all had their justice and peace committees or centers. 
However, they were all controlled by orthodoxy within the church. And so there were issues that were not being attended to that we realized were important. So in the midst of all of this, Bill and I decided we would form a, an organization. And we ended up calling it the Quixote Center because independent one of the other, before we knew each other, we each had very profound experiences with the Quixote theme. And so um, that's how we came up with Quixote. And you know, our friends at the Center of Concern and other places laughed at us. They said, nobody's ever going to take you seriously. And so part of, part of our um, <coughs> goal in setting up the Center was that we wanted to be absolutely independent of any government restraints so that meant no government money, never ask for or receive or take or accept government money, and also to be independent of the institutional church. Well, I'm telling you it wasn't hard to be that because no, they didn't want to come near us anyway, so <laughs> why would they? So what I have here are some, this is very dated, but there are our, um, I'm gonna need to keep one to read from it. Um, our mission statement. So it's a gathering of people who work and pray with laughter <laughs> to reach the stars that seem too distant to be touched or too dim to be worth the effort. We try to be friends with people in need and to celebrate life with people who believe that the struggle to follow Jesus in building a world more justly loving is worth the gift of our lives. So the only thing that's ever changed in this mission statement is the section where it says the struggle to follow Jesus. Initially it says in the struggle to be like Jesus. No, no. This is the original. Be become Jesus followers. And people soon said, you know, we're not followers of Jesus because we had people who were atheists or other religions or faith. <coughs> backgrounds so we changed that to be like Jesus mm -hmm. and so that has remained the thing and the, the key word in here is also laughter because we realized very early on that if you can't laugh you can't last mm -hmm. and so I mean we're good at that mm. we are good at laughing <laughs> we are wicked, we're <laughs> we wicked. Are wicked bad so we started out <coughs> The first thing, we were all church people. In fact, Maureen Fiedler and Bill Callahan and I were the first people at the center. And the first thing we did was starting working on the women's ordination issue, which in those days was cutting edge like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. And what year was this? That, like was, to that would have been 75, oh, actually, mm -hmm. because, yeah, those, that was the year the Episcopal <laughs> women were ordained. 74. In, in 74. And so 75, all that was roiling. <laughs> Women's Ordination Conference happened that year. And so, you know, taking on the ordination issue was really, really cutting edge. And shortly thereafter, we had this guy, Bob Nugent, who was working with us. And he says, you know, I've been working with this nun who has been working with lesbian and gay people in the church. And I'm wondering, you know, we have a dream for a workshop that we'd like to call New Ways. <clears throat> So we said, okay. So Janine came on staff, and then we took on the next least popular <laughs> issue, which was lesbian and gay, and it was only lesbian and gay in those days. It wasn't LGBTQIAB. Um, it was just lesbian and gay. But that created a whole stir also. So if you think the Vatican didn't notice all of this, uh, <coughs> they surely did. And so, and. I think it was started in 1980. It didn't, and that much before that. Um, Bill and another woman and I were traveling in Europe, and he stopped, we were in Rome, and he stopped to say hello to the Jesuits, the, the Kovenbach, who was- He was a good guy. He was, he was a good guy. Bill walked out of there, and he didn't say anything, and a little later he said to me, when the other woman wasn't around, he said, you know, he silenced me. Yeah, and then he was a good guy. And he was a and he was a good guy. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, being silenced is a really serious matter in in the religious <laughs> orders, 
And so he started, that, that's when the battle began actually. And so he tried various ways to, but never mind. <laughs> it didn't work out in the end because they eventually kicked him out. But it took about 10 years or so for that to happen. But you know, in terms of taking on unpopular causes, we were very um, interested also in other secular, in faith -based, not faith-based, but moral, morality-based <laughs> issues. And we had uh, these friends who were trying to find a home for a Karen Silkwood case. And Karen Silkwood was a young union organizer at the Karen McGee nuclear power plant in Oklahoma. And she was mysteriously killed in a car accident on her way to meet with the New York Times reporter. She had her folio of all the documentation that she had been doing about unsafe practices at the power plant and how you know they used to do things that they would they would uh, falsify the negatives and the, the of the, the nuclear rods and everything so Karen Silkwood um, was killed and we took on the case against the company called Kerr McGee and we had a constitutional <laughs> lawyer um, Sarah Nelson who was a feminist Nelson a feminist person from now nobody wanted the case but we did so when it was with us, the case went to the trial and the family won a $10 million award. It never turned out to be $10 million, but that's what initially it was. <laughs> so, so that brought attention you know, from the, from the legal dimension. And the people who were on the case were getting death threats and you know, stay away from this part of the thing, uh, investigation if you want to live. And, and it was, you know, doing what the center had pledged that it was going to do. Well, everybody lived, but, um, you know, that was, the, so those posts. Wasn't there a movie? Karen Silkwood, yeah, it was called Karen Silkwood. Um, Mer Meryl Streep <laughs> was the star in the movie. Yeah. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Netflix, girls, yeah. Netflix. <laughs> yes. Another one on your list, huh? <laughs> yes, yeah. it's, a, it's actually a good movie. And Roma, if you haven't seen. Have you seen Roma? Oh, <coughs> Roma is oh beautiful. Oh my gosh, Roma. You have you seen it? it? I haven't seen it. Oh, oh. No, oh. Put that on your list. Oh, it put should it, have gotten an Academy Award. Put it on your list. It is absolutely... Two years ago, it was the story of the, the family in Mexico and the mm -hmm. women from Oaxaca who were the household servants. You saw it. Yep. It's, it's, if you haven't seen it, it, it it's, it's really wonderful. It's beautiful, yeah. yeah. And the Karen Silkwood movie is also very good. I haven't seen it in years. I've kind of forgotten. I haven't seen it either. Excuse me. So I've, I'd have to see it again. That's interesting. I, yeah. So anyway, um, in the 80s, in yeah. the yeah. early to mid 80s, we started looking at Central America where there was a lot of foment going on in terms of revolutions or attempted revolutions and murders and, you know, mass murders and mass, mass ditches, mass burials, mass burials everywhere. So eventually we came to settle on working in Nicaragua where the revolution had occurred in 1979. And the US government was sponsoring a, co a contra war, a war against the revolution. And it was paying out, you know, like $27 million to support the contras <coughs> in Nicaragua. So we decided that we would do this thing called Quest for Peace, which would match dollar for dollar in humanitarian, donated humanitarian aid for the people of Nicaragua to offset the, the damage that the government <coughs> was doing. So, and not only did we do a humanitarian aid campaign, it, it spread like wildfire around the country. No thanks to us, it just did. It, it, there, just about every state had a quest for peace uh, campaign going on. But the, the real purpose of it was to fight against the Ronald Reagan administration policies and the congressional policies of aid to the Contras. So they were fighting a, con a proxy war, basically, against the revolution in that country. We never took sides in terms of whether we approved of the government or not. We just said we approve of the goals of the revolution. And quite frankly, I never did like the guy who was president. Well, look what's happened. And uh, exactly. look what's happened. Daniel but that's beside Ortega. the point. Mm. It was not about him or that government. It was about <coughs> our government and its interference in the future and the decision making of their own people. So we managed to get the 27 million match the first year. 
And then the next year they appropriated a hundred million. So we did that. And then the next year they appropriated another hundred million and we did that too. But in the midst of all of this were all the letters to Congress, the letters to the president, demonstrations all over the country, solidarity groups everywhere in the United States, and that was part with Witness for Peace, Fellowship of Reconciliation, and other organizations on uh, Nicaragua Network that were really in solidarity. So the government didn't like that. And John Paul II was Pope at the time, and he and Ronald Reagan were good buddies. And so John Paul II was after Bill, who was a Jesuit, on the church stuff, and the government was after the center on the political stuff. So we had investigations by customs, by immigration. Um, we had um, an IRS audit that went on for two or three years. And so none of that slowed us down. We just kept right on going. We just, you know, we dealt with it as we had to. So the day the Sandinistas lost the election in 1990, the day after that, we received a letter from the IRS saying, oh, the audit is closed. And they kept telling us that it wasn't political, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would say that that was the heyday of the center in its most creative years. We had a constituency base of about 60,000 people wow. at that time. And that was pretty amazing. And yeah, after that, we kind of struggled to find a new footing because we didn't have the political battle. And so not long after that, Bill received his, um, I put it simply, his dismissal from the Jesuits. And he had said earlier on, you know, well, years before that, <coughs> well, I should just leave. And I said, is that something you want to do? And he said, no. I said, well, don't. I said, let them kick you out and let them take the responsibility for it. And so he said, fine, and that's what what's happened. But it, I guess it was a little bit like a divorce. By the time it finally happens, that's not very dramatic anymore. It's just, you know, it's over with. <coughs> so it was finished, I'm, I'm free to go. <clears throat> so that was taking care of that. Then in 1990, President Aristide was elected. And he was a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. Now we're in Haiti. In Haiti. Yeah, I'm in Haiti, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. So we decided that he was gonna need some support. And that's how we started working in Haiti. And again, it takes a while when you don't have partners in a country to get your footing. Eventually, we found some partners in Northern Haiti that uh, helped us, and we've been working with them now for, I don't know, 10, 20 years maybe, uh, on reforestation, which is the biggest problem that, well, not the biggest problem, but the biggest ecological problem that Haiti has. So that's been a very successful project. But I want to say that in now I'm retired, and the center is continuing. But I have been aware for many years that our, our most creative time so far is in the past. And I don't know what the future is going to bring. That's all dependent on the events. You know what, the center started out with many cutting edge issues. What's cutting edge anymore? You know, I mean, the ecology is really, really important. There's some serious issues. Immigration is really, really important. There are so many things that are really, really important. But the question is, you know, where, where would the center best, and we're little, best be able to insert itself? And if you have any ideas, I welcome them, really and truly, uh, to insert itself most critically to be a lever in, in being able to move the issue. Not to be able to solve it, but to leverage it. And we know we can't solve the problems of the world. You all know that, too. Even you know that by, at this point, although maybe not. AOC doesn't know that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she's finding out. So I don't know if there's anything else that I've forgotten. I'm sure any number of things, yeah. Um, the, the projects on the back of this are, like I said, a number of them have moved on. And we've done a really good job of spinning off projects and organizations. So several of these things that are mentioned yeah. here are groups that had mm -hmm. their own dreams that they came and got their legs at the center. And then when they had the experience and the 
um, not the funding necessarily, but the experience and the personnel to move on. That's what they've done, and that's been a wonderful thing. And all of the, I can't think of any, we, of all of the organizations, have, you have good relations with them even now, you know, after many, many years. So that's the story of the center in a nutshell. Dolly, let me add two things. One, um, one important issue that I think you folks worked on, which doesn't get a lot of press, but it's the anti-death penalty work. Oh, and yeah. I think that was yeah, terribly right. important, and that also <coughs> spun off into its own <coughs> yes. um, organization. But I think the death penalty is one of those things that is so critically important, right. um, especially from a, from a moral point of view. And, um, and the other thing I want to mention is that they had an intern there one time, a guy who worked there. His name was um, Bill, kind of a tall... New Yorker type. Oh, Bill, de Bla Bill de Blasio, <laughs> who's now the mayor of New York, and um, he <laughs> cut his teeth. He was what, a staff what, member. He was a staff member. He wasn't an intern. He was a staff <laughs> member. So he cut his teeth at the Coyote Center. So um, that's just sort of an interesting. We have a New Yorker with us. And for whatever you think of Bill de Blasio, he, um, <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, not a lot of people are. Not much. Not much, right. But, uh, but he just, just fact, you know, factoid, Bill de Blasio was a, Coyote Center staff person and came last year for the, what anniversary was it? The, it wasn't an anniversary, it was, just a, it was just a reunion. A reunion. And he was expected to come and spend, you know, like politicians do get there late, leave early. And he got there early and left late. So that was how much he admired and, and, and spoke warmly of you and of Bill and of Maureen. And, yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> that, no was a, that was a big deal that actually to get him. And that was, it huge. was huge. Yeah. That was a big yeah. deal. But he was, he was the one who was lucky. I mean, if he knows anything, which he, there's some evidence he doesn't know everything, but he, if he knows anything, I'm sure he learned a lot of it at Coyote. He said that. Mm -hmm. So, I want to give a plug, as I see Priest for Equality here. Oh, that's what started For this. your inclusive language, your inclusive Bible. And the reason is, I never appreciated that until this past month when I'm working on my liturgy book for Liturgical Press. And one of their early questions a couple months ago is what Bible translation are you using? And I'm using the inclusive Bible, as you know, because I mentioned it to you. And I thought, wow, to be able to work on liturgy and have an inclusive Bible that a liturgical press recognizes is such an, a, an accomplishment that you probably don't even think about because who thinks about the inclusive Bible these days? I know. It's, it's, I mean, there are lots and lots of things like that that are really important. That Well, there's somebody's dissertation is here. You know, somebody will write a dissertation on the Quixote Center and the history and the accomplishments. So, Well, I've been doing a really good job over the many years of keeping archives. Where are they? At Marquette. Unfortunately <laughs> now, but anyway, that's where they are. My alma mater, yeah, we didn't put ours there, but, but it's all right. But that's where they are. And the guy who was there, the archivist who was there, was very good for a while. Bill Bliss. Uh, I don't remember his name, but he was... He was really good. He was very good, yeah. He was wonderful. And there are like... The, the, the key with archives is put like with like, and the Catholic Worker is there, the Women's Nation Conference is there, so there are... Mary B. Lynch papers oh, are wonderful. there. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So I don't know who all else, but they have a lot of progressive organizations there. So, yeah, we, I mean, we had another project, the Prison Radio Project, which was basically working to get this um, man who was in, on death row in Pittsburgh or outside of Pittsburgh for killing uh, the police officer. He was convicted, and his name is Mumia Abu-Jamal, and the goal of this project was to get Mumia out. He was a Black Panther, a young journalist in Philadelphia, and there was a riot, and one night a police officer was killed, and de, Bla uh, de Blasio, um, Mumia was accused and fingered and sentenced to death. And so this woman, Noelle Hanrahan, was on our staff, and you know she was has been working and this continues to work to get Mumia. He's off death row. She succeeded in doing that. That's now, not something not too long ago. That's a couple years now. Yeah. And, um, and now she's working to get a new trial for him because he's, he's clearly, uh, clearly innocent and he says he didn't do it and I believe him. But then that's, you know, a lot of people say that and they're guilty anyway. Mm -hmm. But Mumia is a prolific writer. Um, you look up Prison Radio Project on your stuff and you'll see more about that. <coughs> I want to just make one other comment, and I think we should throw out some <laughs> questions and things that you might 
um, <laughs> want to hear about because there's so much. But one of the things that I notice in both in the telling of the story and now observing the Coyote Center from for the last forever is that those of us who have taken on churches are absolutely fearless to take on anybody or anything else. This is true. And I think this is a very interesting observation <laughs> that that I have that, that, that I have become more persuaded of that we are we you know we don't care who you are or what you are or where you are. Those of us who have taken on like the women's ordination question or the LGBTIQA plus question in, church, in the Roman Catholic Church, what what do I care if somebody you know a, a guy knocks on the door here and wants to come in because and he shouldn't I escort him right downstairs myself. I mean you know we, we we have a certain fearlessness about those in authority or those who might someone might suggest had some power over us. We know differently. We're not intimidated. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. And I, it's, it's a kind of it's a kind of boldness born of real struggle against stuff that is said to be, I mean, talk about the religion, this is to the religion majors, you know, said to be <laughs> eternal, and, you know, the, like the Pope, I mean, we don't take the Pope any more seriously than the, you know, guy who comes and changes the light bulbs, I mean, truly we don't, we don't, we don't, we, we wouldn't accord him any more or any less uh, respect that we would accord our, our the guys who come here that we accord the, the same respect. And well, we probably a, challenge him more. Well, we challenge him more. Position. We'd be grateful to the guys. At least they do something useful and they're wonderful. But you know, we that, we don't have that kind of of which many people have that kind of awe. Yeah, awe or, or fear. worry or lack of self confidence that somehow someone is better than they are. We've never you've never met anyone better than you. Ever. No, I've met people smarter than me, though. But not by much. <laughs> <laughs> not by much, Dolly. They're not by much. Not by much. Because we always say here, like with the Grail, together we're a genius. It's, you know, it's the collective. But the issue is that that's a very distinguishing characteristic. That when you take on issues in religion, not and I don't mean battling the churches, but even take on the ideological issues of, you know, what or if or whether there's a God, those kinds of questions, you're not fearful about somebody like Donald Trump. And we don't... You know, there's, there's no fear at that point. Um, and I think that's, I find that very freeing, and I've seen that in you, and I've seen that in Maureen, and, you know, Diane and others. It's just, we, we don't, we, we truly do not, we don't care what you think. We don't care what you do. You know, there's a moral compass there that's, and I don't mean it in a righteous way, but I mean, yeah. it's, it's an observation. That, yeah, and talking of not being fearful, <laughs> we were talking the other day about when we started the center, when you started water. Yeah. We knew nothing. And we had nothing. And we had nothing. <laughs> we started with a stapler and a three-hole punch. That's what we started with. And you started with as much. Less. Less. We had the stapler because I had it in college. <laughs> we had nothing. We started in we our We had a uh, few books. <laughs> we started in because our, it's dining, the only thing room, we our dining room table. <laughs> On just Avenue, we lived on Just Avenue. We started on our dining room. I know, table. kitchen table theology. Kitchen. I laugh every time I see it. It's exactly how we started. Well, and you were a nun and he was a priest. And you were a nun and I was a you know, graduate student who finished graduate school. Say it so. right. I was in the convent. Oh, you were in the convent. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Dolly Powell was in the convent. She was never a nun, but she was she's there. I don't know what she was doing. But, but, I mean, you know, that's not like you had a trust fund and you just said, oh, I think I'll do whatever I feel like. I mean, it was like we didn't have it. We you didn't had, have it. I used my... my Excess baggage allowance to go to Argentina and my dissertation typed. I mean. And left it with me to get it done. <laughs> Let's be clear. You know, I think at the base of all of this, I want to I want to insert spirituality because spirituality as search for meaning in life. And I think at the base of all of our justice work is we're not afraid to search for that meaning, and we're not afraid to confront everyone who. Um, I don't want to say invalidates that meaning or or diminishes the meaning in life, uh, the the spiritual right that everyone has. And I think that's what gives us the spark to be about the justice that we've been doing, the justice work that we've been doing. But how about your questions and, and comments to Dolly? Because I think it'll be interesting from your various perspectives. I'm going to tell you a little story while you're thinking of questions. This is about young people. Last summer, I bought a pressure washer, you know, 
to wash the sidewalks and get the stuff clean, the grut, crud out. So I sent a message out to my neighbors <laughs> saying, you know, if you want to come help me initiate this and inaugurate it, please, you're welcome. So I got this email, this text back from somebody that says, who are you? Who are, letter R, you? And so I wrote back and I said, well, this is Dolly. And she says, well, and I said, well, she says, you know, she says, I have to assume that you're not going to the same school as I am since you're pushing a power washer. And she says, she was a rising sophomore in high school. So I wrote back, I said, well, I'm a 76 year old at this point. And I says, I think you're right. <laughs> we don't know each other. And so at the end I wrote, okay, well, I'm a 76-year-oldster. Be happy and enjoy a full life. This is somebody who got in my, I don't know how it got here. <laughs> it, it just got here. They get there is all I can say. And so then she wrote saying, then she wrote, she says, got any advice? <laughs> Which I thought was really very sweet for somebody just going on to a sophomore year in high school. It was very smart when you girl. know when you're at the peak of knowing everything there is to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got any advice? So I wrote back and I say this to you all. Always be honest with yourself. Trust your better instincts. Know that you will make the best decision you can with the information you have. I think the third one is probably the most important one to me. Mm -hmm. Make the best decision that you have and don't look back because you're doing the best you can with the information you have. So at 77, I can say to you, I don't regret any decisions. If I'd had different information, I might have made different decisions. Mm -hmm. But just, just be honest with yourselves. Mm -hmm. That's my message. Anyway, this... Now, the rising junior, I wished her a happy summer. She said thanks. <laughs> but I do, I, I do stay away from communicating because it could be creepy, you yeah. know? Yeah. 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 That old lady down the street. Yeah. That old lady. Yeah. I don't even know where she lives. That's a good thing. I don't know who she is. I don't know where she lives. I don't know anything yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. So how about questions or comments you might have? What, what does this, any, any? insights or responses, especially about Coyote, because it's such an interesting... Um, well, you said that you were thinking about sort of where the where the center should be positioning itself right now, because it doesn't have the same like focus that it did before, the same clear focus. And I was wondering, like, um, like what do you think are the strengths of that, of the Coyote Center? Like, what would make it like, what tools does it have that would make it fit in a certain place? Well, at this stage of the game, the center has a lot of years of experience, 40 years now plus. Mm -hmm. And it has a reputation for being straightforward and honest. Mm -hmm. It has a reputation for being inclusive, I believe. Um, it has a reputation for being willing to take on new things. And so it has a reputation for being open to new ideas and new people and new ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, it does, yeah. I think going off of that, my question was around how you picked which issues you really invested in because it seemed like such a broad spectrum. And of course, so many justice issues are interconnected. Um, but how did you pick which issues you really <coughs> um, invested in? Well, that's, an in, that's a very good question because we didn't have a five-year plan. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a strategic plan. We never did. And we tried that once. It didn't work for us. <laughs> um, but the, basically, the way the programs developed were out of the hopes and the dreams of people on the staff. So, like I said, new, the New Ways Ministry came out of this guy who was on the staff who was working with lesbian and gay people and wanted to do a program. And so that's how that became one program. Um, the death penalty work came out of a staff person who was working on another project 
who was really committed to working against the death penalty. And so he brought up a proposal to start working on the death penalty. And that, that's, that's mainly out of the initiative of the people who were on the staff. Like I said, it wasn't a five-year plan. <laughs> but then when the proposals came up, we recognized them for the value that they had. And also, basically, the commitment that the individuals had to make this work. And that's, that's key. Because if you, you know, put out a job description for somebody to come work at the Quixote Center on the death penalty, that's a job description. It's not a passion. And so that's, we depended mainly on the passion of people who were there. That's how the radio project began with Maureen. You know, she, she, she had an, a, an epiphany one time driving up north to New York. And that epiphany was just like, oh my God, we need a radio show that does progressive, positive, religious imaging in the radio world besides Rush Limbaugh. You know, I mean, that was it. And so that was, that came, it, that became her passion. And so that's how the projects developed. Mm -hmm. That seems beautifully connected to your advice earlier about like trusting your instinct and your inner self. And it sounds like you trusted your staff to do that. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. That's really cool. That's really beautiful. Like interesting model. Yeah. Usually to feel like, yeah. Yeah. Jobs aren't too right now, obviously. It's like you have to kind of like sell yourself, <laughs> even if it's not necessarily like something you're passionate about, but like actually believing in your staff. Well, come work partner. at the Quixote Center. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your passion. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I always say here, too, that, yeah, that you know, I always talk about vocation. Mm -hmm. That, you know, people say, well, I'm trying to find my vocation. You know, what's my vocation? And I always say, well, your vocation is what you can do that nobody else in the world can do. And if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. And I think that's a very simple, you know, it's what you can do. You, what you're describing is what you could do mm -hmm. that nobody else could have done. And if you hadn't done it, it wouldn't have happened. wouldn't have happened. Same thing with water. But the question is, how can we create, and that's one of the things that you've done so well, is create a frame so that other people can do what only they can do, like Bob and Janine, or like Maureen. You created a, a scaffolding for them to be able to do what only they could do. And if they hadn't done it, it wouldn't have happened. And I think that's what, it's a different thing than getting a job. Getting a job is because you have to pay rent <laughs> and student loans. And, yeah. you know, and, and that's, that's real. That's a realistic It's thing very to do. real. And, it's, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with it. There's, it's, and it's not an afterthought. It's not a, it's not a second class thing. It's a moment. But especially for women with the kind of skills and talents that we have around this table, being able to do something that's more your vocation is within reach. And I think that's what most people don't have. I, I was reading this morning about, about you know the sort of the definition of the of, of someone who's bourgeois is that there's you, you think about you know most people think about their bodies, and people who are bourgeois also think about ideas. So they have like two lives at once, and most people will only be able to think about their bodies, and not have a life of ideas. And most people like us who have such privilege also have a life of ideas, and the it's out of the ideas and the imagination that comes this kind of vocational possibility and I think that's what that's what we, we at water at least want to launch you know when you saw Annabeth yesterday I mean she she's moving in her vocational you know into her vocation what she what she's gonna do that nobody else is gonna do so and let me say that I think water after all of these years and all the interns that have been through water has been impactful on the lives of young people in ways that continue forever in their lives your lives are different and will continue to be different forever. We say once you get into water, you can't get out. You, can't, yeah. <laughs> you don't you drown. Can, you can take the girl out of water, but you can't take the water yeah, out of the right. girl. Yeah. yeah. That's. A, th thank you for that, Dolly. And I was sitting here thinking, where are the foundational places? Uh, and you just gave a shout out to water. So, water's one. When we grew up just to tap into our the history on this side of the table. There was, the churches still had market share. There were still people in the churches. There were people in the pews. There were seminaries that had uh, provided theological studies. If not only for men, they were opening up for women. I went to seminary in 77, you went in 74. There was, there was ferment. 
for the kind of work that we were then able to mm -hmm. provide through our passions and through our vocations. Um, the churches have lost that now. The high schools that we went to are no longer in existence. So you both boarded. We both went to girls' boarding schools. And um, even even the, the, I'll say Catholic for a minute, the Catholic high schools are now in jeopardy. Indiana, uh, a, Indianapolis, a case in point, the Indianapolis Archdiocese, and the, the problems with LGBT um, faculty in the schools and the, the <coughs> archbishop who's a canon lawyer coming down on them it's a different moment in history so i i'm asking myself where are the formation places if you will um for the kind of people that we become and I, and even as i say that that limps because we all become who we're meant to be but we've got to have those touchstones, those um, those homes, if you will, that that provide what's going to take us forward to live our vocation and our passion. Well, you know, Callie's working on an article, and I, I I'm anxious to see it now as as it comes into Callie's both a religion major and a. Is that your parking meter? Um, no. Nah. <laughs> uh, Cal, Callie's both a religion major and a creative writing major, and so she's taken an article on that that. Uh, other people have tried and not really succeeded at, but I think, are you almost done? I have to write the Jeanette Stokes paragraph. Done? Um, okay. Yeah. So what she's doing is she's taking a look at water, the Faith Trust Institute, Marie Fortune's uh -huh. shop that worked on religion, works on religion and violence, and the Center for Women in Ministry in the South, which is Jeanette Stokes uh, in, in Raleigh-Durham, and it's a, it's a center that works on feminist spirituality and has done so for 40 years. And she's comparing and contrasting those centers and the founders of those centers because all three of us out of four, Diane being the fourth, three out of four of us who are the founders of those centers spent that summer at Grailville in the seminary quarter program that the Grail had over this in the 70s. And we met each other there. We met other women. It was the beginning of real cohorts of women, especially Protestant women in ministry. And the example of the Grail, women on tractors, women milking cows, women writing books and <laughs> conducting liturgies, I mean, doing everything was an impetus. So everybody who went away from those programs, only four, su four summers, are we talking about? Yes, was because it? by my summer, it had ended. Right. I mean, I went to seminary in 77. By 78, I think that seminary yeah. quarter was Yeah, what was, was it, 75, no 6, 7, 8? It ended, I think the last one was 77. 77. Yeah, yeah. So right. 74 was the first one, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And it was... You know, everybody went. I mean, that, that, that you know, you know, names that you so know. So you got your formation there the way, the way we got formation in religious community. Yeah, it, yeah. But, yeah. Our, yeah, but, it, but since then, and the only other program I know like that was at um, Vanderbilt. They had three or four summer programs for people doing queer studies in religion where people came together. And we would do well to have a program, even a week-long program this yes, summer. Yes, we would. To, to bring together women in religious studies for a week to, to really look at things. So in other words, we have to we have to create more of those because they're not out there. I That's mean, where right. else would you go? Do you know of other places, other programs where you could go, for example, Kennedy, Kelly? Well, our religious studies department, we're trying to have a retreat with um, Spellman and Wesleyan, the other oh, women's cool. college, but it has not been materializing. You, the other place that you could go is the, the Erie Benedictines with Joan Chittister are having their second and I think it's this week, their second week-long or two-week-long program with Joan on feminist theology at the monastery. Well, who could be better? Nobody. And right. it, so, so those are, but there are very few, especially for Protestant women, Claire, where would you go? What would you, where else would you for go for? a gathering of women. Yeah, to the, studying theology, studying for ministry. Is there anything? Um, not that I can think of right off the bat. I mean, what came to mind when you were speaking was I had a friend who just finished at um, Vanderbilt Divinity School that went to a gathering of LGBTQ theology students, ministers. That's what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Okay, I wasn't was sure a, if you're focusing on that was the, it was the summer. It was a summer program that was at Vanderbilt, right? Well, it wasn't at Vanderbilt. I think it actually happened in Florida, and I would have to look up the name, oh, okay. but it was with um, Kevin Garcia is... Um, Mm -hmm. The guy who started mm -hmm. Church Clarity, um, who's all about holding churches accountable to like have something on your website that says your position, because just the not knowing is really harmful, yeah. because you mm -hmm. go in and build mm -hmm. relationships and then find out that 
people don't love all of you. And um, so I had a friend who went to that. And so was it good? Yeah, he loved it. I mean, I haven't gotten to hear in depth, but I and that was all around the country. People had to reply. Mm-hmm. And here's another. You might. It sounds like you might be familiar with it. Anyways, that's that's uh, what I so thought mm-hmm. of when you were describing. Well, yeah, that. Any, well, I, I don't know where content, I would go. And the content isn't so much the key. It's the the gathering and the networking mm-hmm. that happens mm-hmm. when you do it, mm-hmm. and and then something happens that shows you that you're not by yourself. When we went to Grailville, Kelly, as you as you read, when we all went to Grailville in those years. We were from <laughs> seminaries around the country, each of which had a little pocket of women. You know, there were there was no critical mass of women in any. You know, Drew, uh, Duke, Harvard, Berkeley, Yale. We all came from those places, but from little from little enclaves of women. And then all of a sudden, when you're in with twenty women, and you're living together in Loveland, Ohio, for the summer, trust me, it's a lot of fun. And you feel shot out of a gun, if you will, just in the sense that you're like, wow, we're out there. We're and you go back to your place, you say. What do you mean, God, He, Lord, Father, Ruler, King? <laughs> I, know, I don't get that. Never <laughs> heard of it. And you know, and, and people. So, but you also had people to back you up. And these three centers that Kelly's writing about, institutionalized or organized. We didn't think we were building institutions, but organized ourselves. And Coyote's another example of that. Mm-hmm. So, I, I think the question is, where are there new ones like that? And yeah, and, where, and, who and follows yes, it? and how can the organizations like Coyote and Water and others? Continue spawn, to spawn new ones. to um, to create this kind of space, or is there a time when it's time to pass it on? And to just let it be exactly, yeah. and and I think those of us who've been in organizations for you know thirty, forty, fifty years uh, are in that space of okay, where does this need to go now, and how does this need to go? forward. Uh, and I don't think we have the answers yet. I think the questions are on the table. What do you all see? Because that's where the answer is going to reside. You know, where are you going to put your energies and how are you going to be about the justice work that needs to be done in as the earth moves forward? And as well, the another way to ask it is if you thrives. didn't have to make money. And you didn't have to. If you didn't have no, but you it's could true. do whatever you want. If you could do whatever you want, what would you do? And that's really the question. To I make think. a difference in the world. I mean, yeah, but yeah. You don't, not, you don't know the answers to that yet. <laughs> no, but but that's an imaginative question that's useful. If you if you did, if money weren't an issue, what is it that you would do? Because that's how that's how you figure out what it is that you're passionate about. And like somebody came to Coyote and said, because and and most of us, I mean, we we just did this because we and we didn't know how we didn't make money. I mean, we just did it. You know, when you think about money, <laughs> I mean, because the other side of it is all of us have lived simply, and that's you know, I mean, I know very few people have gotten rich doing this kind of work, um, and yet we've managed, and because we believe in reusing the resources of the world. I mean, look around this this space. This is all thrift store stuff, except the rug that we're sitting on, which has been a don- donation, but it's all donations that. Uh, we didn't need to buy something new. We needed to reuse what was already available. Um, well, it's like the books, how the books come. We don't buy the books. <laughs> the books come from the publishers because it's a quid pro quo. They send us the book. We tell them what we think of it. If we Maybe. want to promote it. Hmm? Maybe. No, no, we do. Yeah, we, we do. We, we do. do. We say yes thank you. No. No. Yes, every book that comes in gets really? acknowledged. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. We wow. either look at it or we either put it in our list of what we're reading, that which is what they're doing, or we put it in a thank you no, and we send thank you, we'll put it in our resource center, or we get rid of it. But the reason they send them to us is because they know that if we promote it, they'll sell books, we'll sell books and sure. they'll sell ideas, and we'll sell you know, and we and we that that's one of the ways we shape the field is by what we tell people to read. So those are ways that you know we it's not like we're spending money or they're spending everybody's winning, and that's another kind of strategy to, to how do you win? How does everybody win? Mm-hmm. Any other questions? So being 20-ish years old, it's not easy being in your 20s. Trust me, I believe that. No, I my remember, sister and I say that it's the hardest uh, time. It's, it's the, the hardest, hardest time. It's the hardest Even teenagers time. are not as hard. <coughs> so I'm not I, I turned 30 and I was ecstatic. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the world changed for me. But the thing that I've realized over the years is that it will become clear to you what you need to do. You don't know it today. I don't know today what I'm going to be doing in the rest of my retirement, mm-hmm. but it will become clear. 
and you don't know what you're doing the rest of your lives, you know what you're doing next year, maybe, but it will become clear. So just believe that. Questions? Got any, did you have a question? Anything What's the Kiholi Center doing right now? Right now the center is working mainly primarily on um, the, the immigration issue and the justice questions that surround it mm -hmm. and is doing some accompaniment of people who are going to their, uh, what do they call them, their appointments, their ICE appointments. Their ICE appointments. And so I would say that that's the major initiative we're continuing the work in Haiti of the reforestation. We're continuing in Nicaragua working on the um, house building, but Nicaragua's been in a wicked upheaval, so that's that's been a disrupted program. And then there was another group that we worked with in Nicaragua that was we've stopped working with because there was some dishonesty going on with money, and that was in the countryside. And the director was getting cars and. Double, double spending, et cetera. So we kind of like let that go. And then um, nominally there's still this thing called Catholic Speak Out, which mainly at this point is only the promotion of um, the, the lectionaries, the inclusive lectionaries and the inclusive Bible, which, which is still, that was a 10 year translation project. So that was you know, still a good thing. <coughs> and Let's see, what else is the center doing? Hmm. Dolly, I appreciate that you mentioned, um, for example, in the case of the Nicaraguan countryside double dipping thief, that there are um, yes. that, that there are uh, projects and people along the way which don't work, uh -huh. which are failures or don't pan out the way you hope or disappoint. Move in a different direction than yeah. they were initially. And, that, and that's okay too, that's sort of part of the deal. So everything that we try at water, everything we start, everything we hope to do, we don't always accomplish. You and probably haven't had this experience because you have been limited in that you do the you know, finances yourselves, I suppose. Or we do. Anyway, we had this business manager and the center was in a major transition, so things were not being um, monitored very well, who managed to skim off $50,000. And she did it very smartly, actually. And I was suspecting her of padding her hours, but then she she left for some reason or other, and it was shortly thereafter that we discovered that she had been using what we used for transferring money to the projects in Nicaragua and Haiti. She had been using that format for transferring money into her checking account. And I mean, it was very cleverly done. It would never have ever occurred to me to, to look there for anything. Anyway, it worked out. We got the money back. We went, you know, we went through the government and the, the legal system, and it, and it worked out. We got it back. But but every organization, maybe not water, has that kind of experience if it mm -hmm. lasts long enough. So so you know nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. And it happens. Yeah. And it happened in the Nicaraguan countryside. It happened at the Quixote Center. Yeah. You know, there it does happen. It happens. Yeah. On that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you each a copy of these books. This was a book written by Bill Thank Callahan, you. my cohort in wow. crime at the center yeah. on noisy contemplation. Thank you. And it's a great, it's a great read. <laughs> and it doesn't really matter if you're a Catholic or atheistic or whatever. I think what for me the book does is that. It puts a spin on how you look at life and how you interact with people. And it's called noisy contemplation because he believed that most people <coughs> don't have the opportunity to go away to a retreat house in order to get closer to God. And so that you have to take advantage of your daily life and the people that you interact with to spend time contemplating them and saying, how are you today, Callie? <laughs> how are you today? You know? And et cetera. So 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 read it with that with that filter in mind. At least that's how I read it. My favorite line in the book is at the end. At the end of the book on one seventy one, 
We travel with a God who loves us. We travel with a community of faith. We'll awful, often remember that we're crabgrass Christians whose love can survive the cracks of life's sidewalks. Our love reminds us that God's spirit is with us always. We are blessed with the merry God. Indeed, we are the entertainment. <laughs> I really like that line. <laughs> and then... He was a great fellow, by the way. Absolutely. He, he was. I wasn't particularly objective, but he was a wonderful, wonderful... I wasn't particularly objective either. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so Bill used to write poems, and a lot of them he wrote when I said, Bill, we need a poem. <laughs> Who did Sancho Panza? That was the... Oh, Bill, Bill, Bill did Sancho, yeah. yeah. But we've had good Sancho since then, yeah, too. Decent, he, well, yeah, decent, yeah. He wasn't the only, yeah. the only good I Sancho. I suspect you might have written some, Dolly. Yeah. <laughs> that is wonderful that Sancho Panza was the sort of... Um, the squire. The squire, but he was he was written up in the in, as a kind of coyote meme, really, as the um, computer, wasn't he with a... We named our first computer Sancho. Sancho. Yeah. <laughs> and then we gave, we gave him an anthropomorphic uh, personality where he was a spy in the Quixote Center. And he told he was, all the dirt. He right? told all the dirt and he was conservative. And so he would write these letters. Kind of a curmudgeon. Letters, a curmudgeon. And he would write these letters to our constituents and say, please, please, please. Don't give. Don't give any money to these people. They're doing this and they're doing that, 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 that. And so. If he would give it droves, you know, Sancho told them not to. It was Sancho great. It was said, a great, don't do it. Don't one of the, one of the great uh, creative pieces of fundraising. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for being patient and listening to this. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you. Thank you for pleasure, the wonderful history you. and tradition. I don't think we have this yeah, we one. Do. Yes, oh, we do, do we? Dolly, we have a history here of having authors sign their books, and I <laughs> saw this one sticking out. Remember this one? Yeah, Way I remember back. that. My goodness. I looked in and I oh, thought, my God. I know, look at it, but there's no signature in here. Well, so, Dad Maureen's not around. Um, I know. How have I missed this opportunity? Anyway, oh, your and own, what other one is, are, is your own book? What should I pull off the shelf that has your name on it? There's that. I know that. Yeah, but this also, Dolly is the editor of this. It, she, Bill's picture's on it, but in fact, Dolly is the editor. I'm the editor, yeah. You're the editor of this one. And more yeah, I don't think so. I put that in there. What? That I'm the editor. Yeah, it's right here. Have I said that? Oh, okay. Okay, I so know. I think you should yeah, sign this Yeah, this was published after, after Bill died. Yeah. Bill died, what, seven years ago? Nine years ago. Nine years ago, wow. Fourth oh of July. Gosh. Fifth of July. I know, but that yeah, weekend. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. weekend. Right. Yeah, you won't forget that. I won't forget so. <laughs> I had to, My job was to call Georgetown and um, figure out how we're going to get Bill's body donated when he died so that it could be used for research, which we successfully managed over Fourth of July weekend. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I'm... Um, I'm not going to donate my body. No? No? It's too hard on the people who stay behind. It lasts oh, forever. And all right. Never. Having yeah. done that. Having, yeah, okay. You know, Debbie, Cheryl's partner, um, donated her body, and uh -huh. we went to Georgetown a year or so later when they had the... the, the yeah, the ceremony. Which was the, lovely. They, they have a ceremony so that... They the, didn't it, have that stupid Jesuit priest that said mass or something? I, we wouldn't have sat through that. Uh. <laughs> no. Um, but they had a. It was a wonderful ceremony for the for the incoming medical students who were going to use the use cadavers, and they have all the families come. Yeah, that part was nice. Yeah, but it does prolong <coughs> the grieving. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was rich beyond imagining. Abs beyond imagining. Wow. Thank you. Um, and we, as you I'm know, Richard have it on tape. Done here. <laughs> if you would like, um, yeah. out of my but league, you know, I don't know how it gets off my what? phone to you or Could anybody else. Could somebody send it to Dolly and, and, send, and then send, we'll send it to them? Or you should send it to Marquette for, your, for the archive. Yeah, for the archives, for sure. Yeah. That would be Absolutely. very important. Yeah. Yeah, very yeah. important. Would somebody do that? Somebody take that on? I could Callie? Do okay. That. And I can work with you on it in terms of getting it where it needs to go. And you get it to my email? Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. And we can get it. I think we should send it also directly to Marquette so you don't have to do that. Oh, you could do that too. Yeah, I think we could do that. that. We'll call the great. archives. And that'd be great. Kennedy, yeah. we might get you a call in the archives. This is, the team here can do anything. This yeah, is, I this know. Is, that's so wonderful. It is wonderful. <laughs> it is wonderful. And it, when it works, it works. When you have a team that doesn't work, this team works. But there are sometimes teams that don't work. They, you know, It happens. It happens. But 
list team happens to work, so it's wonderful. It's good. Dolly, thank you again. Your time, your talent, your You're very commitment. Welcome. Your friendship, your colleagueship. Whenever we need anything, whenever I need anything, call Dolly. Well, I would say, Dave, Dolly will know the answer. <laughs> if she Dolly, doesn't know it, she makes it she up. Makes up. <laughs> and she tells a good story. So. <laughs> and we have for many years had a, a dinner, the group with Maureen Fiedler, who's just gone to the Loretto Mother House, called The Best and the Brightest, and there are only four of us in the group. So that gives That's you an okay. idea of the... The, the B&B dinners that, that we've had yeah. over the years. And uh, shameless. We are shameless about it. But we've also been through the tre- in the trenches with some of this stuff. Oh, and, God, yes. And by the way, have you signed this new Catholic statement? I think it's... I just signed it this morning. Good, good. Marianne Glendon again? They exhumed her. She's the head of that committee. Yeah, yeah. Exhumed for the picture, but come on. Unbelievable. She was the one who ran the Vatican delegation in Beijing that started all the horrors for women in the world. Literally... Women have died of reproductive uh, lack of choice because of Miriam Glendon. I mean, I, you know, there are people you can hold personally responsible for some of this stuff. I kind of took on Mother to the Quixote Center the other day. They have put something out with a bunch of pictures, and one of them was a picture of Mother Teresa. I saw, you saw it that? with Diana. Is that where I saw it? I don't know if a it was with Diana. Of Princess Diana. No, I think it was just Mother Teresa. All right, oh, okay. What was she doing? I don't know what she was doing, but they... Did you I, tell her to take it down? Or? I didn't tell them to take it down. I wrote... I wrote publicly, I said, you know, I have my issues with Mother Teresa, and I talked about the luncheon that I had with her in, in Mexico City. I've never heard this. Oh, in 1975, International you know, Mother Women's Teresa, Year, Calcutta. Calcutta, <laughs> and 75, and the Vatican delegation included Mother Teresa. And somehow or other, I got invited, I went there as a journalist, and I got invited to this luncheon with Mother Teresa and the Vatican delegation. So Mother Teresa's sitting there. I'm sitting here throughout the whole lunch. And so I started quizzing her about women's ordination. And so In what language? In, in English. English, okay. And yeah, she spoke very good English. And she said, oh, no, she says, none of her sisters, you know, they never go anywhere without a priest. And if there's not a priest that can go with them, then they can't go. And I said, well, if you had women in your order that were ordained, then you would be able to have a priest with you always. <laughs> what did she say? Oh, no, 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 no. Anyway, and then there was this debate that broke out about women having abortions, and women who had abortions were <coughs> murderers. And what? Murderers. Oh, murderers. Murderers. Sure. And so we argued about abortion, we argued about birth control, we argued about women's ordination, we argued about just about everything, the two of us, throughout the whole meal. So I wrote back on the Quixote reply thing all the stuff that I <laughs> had issues with her about. And uh, John, John just kind of said, well, you know, every clock that is stopped is right twice a day. <laughs> well. So anyway. her own sisters referred to her as a dictator. Oh, I was she was, she a was dictator in a dish a dish towel. towel. A dictator in a dish towel is what we always called her. Oh. She, you know, the, like, William Sonoma has those those dish towels that are like linen, and then they have like a stripe. Have you, do you know William Sonoma, the kitchen? Yeah. It's a high end kitchen store, and it's called mm-hmm. William Sonoma. And yeah. Those are their dish towels. So a dictator in a dish towel. But there's also we have actually here Christopher Hitching's book, Missionary Position, which is her, his scathing critique. He since died, but Christopher Hitching's wrote. A scathing critique of Mother Teresa. I I was wondering if my own prejudices against Mother Teresa were totally biased. So she um, was in India with the poorest of the poor, and the Sisters of Saint Joseph, which are the community that I was in, had sisters in the same same town, same city. And when it came time for prayer, Mother Teresa's sisters would <laughs> off to the chapel didn't matter if there was somebody dying on the street or whatever. And the sisters of St. Joseph, if it came time for prayer, and there was somebody dying on the street or giving birth or whatever. That was the prayer. That was the prayer. And so I, I didn't know this, but I was friends with the woman who was president of the sisters of St. Joseph in France, and we were having this conversation. And she had been a missionary in India a lot of years, working alongside with Mother Teresa and these other sisters. And she told me these stories directly. So uh, I have my reasons. Oh, absolutely. No. 
And so I wrote, I wrote in my, part of my responses, how do I know this? Because I had lunch with her and we went through all of this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's so important. I mean, history, that's part of it. I mean, being as old as we are, history is something that has a place. And, yeah. and for people to sort of all of a sudden put up an image because it's a woman, and a woman from a developing country, and a woman who's proposed for sainthood, and all. And a woman who has achieved sainthood. Yeah, or she is a saint. She is she? a saint now. Is she? I can't remember. I was name. joking with some a friend of mine who was with me in Mexico. I said, "Let's go to her canonization." <laughs> Has she been canonized already? Yeah. Okay, I'd forgotten about that. But. Yeah. You know what? You said you were going to end this at eleven. I know, and I lied. And you okay. lied. <laughs> so you lied. thank I, you. 